It is four o'clock and we are now in session for this uh, workshop and we're going to begin with the information and discussion on the Boating Center presentation. So, Mayor, uh, Ms. Moser is going to introduce this item and our um, consultant that worked on this project. Uh, while she's working her way to the podium, I'll say that this is an initiative that came to us from um, various stakeholders in the community that had an interest. Um, it was privately funded, so we did not pay for it. But um, uh, it, was a, it was an attempt to try to understand just really the feasibility and the potential cost. We haven't really gotten beyond that, but we felt like it was a time to at least give you all a peek at what it is that we've come up with that would be possible, uh, but it's not funded. It doesn't um, have any uh, designated uh, sources of funding outlined. Uh, there are several interested parties, but that would be something we'd kind of move on to as a next step, um, assuming that everything is um, in order and there's, there's an interest in pursuing it. So with that, I'll ask Sherry to introduce the item. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And so, um, yes, this is a presentation of a feasibility study for a boating center. And Austin Powers with Kimley Horn out of the Dallas office is going to be making the presentation. And um, so one of the first tasks that I had coming on board was to seek experts in the field. And so that's what we did um, by hiring Kimley Horn. And then I'll let Austin take it from here. Thank you. Okay. How are you guys doing? Thank you Good, for having thank me you. in. Yeah. I was told there would be a presentation up here, and how we get it, I don't know. There it is. Like, yeah, magic. Just ask for it. Oh, uh, there it is. There's okay. someone in behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you for having me up. Um, to kind of reiterate what Mr. McDaniel said, uh, the purpose of this project was to gauge user groups, groups' interest and in, um, physical feasibility for a boating facility on Nimitz Lake. So that was the, that was what we were tasked to do. That's what uh, we started with. And um, going into it, we learned the project location, uh, west side of Nimitz Lake. It's kind of on the northeast corner of the uh, McDonald's company's mixed use development, uh, which is a 58 uh, acre mixed use development. <coughs> and you can see it in the uh, red circle there. It's uh, located in the 100 year floodplain of the Guadalupe Squeeze River. It. Um, a little bit about Nimitz Lake. You guys know it's the uh, primary purpose is the uh, city water supply, uh, but it also has other uh, recreational values such as fishing and non uh, non field boating, swimming, things like that. Uh, it's real long and narrow, but about an average depth of 10 feet. So it's got some decent depth. It's got some decent length. It's, it's a little challenge from a width standpoint, but um, all in all, it's got uh, lots of value for the city. Uh, the landing, which is the uh, development that I was referring to previously, is a, a mixed-use residential restaurant commercial development. The, the parcel that I'm referring to for the boating study was the kind of northeast corner of that one-and-a-half-acre lot right there in the, where the circle is along the uh, lake frontage, uh, kind of connecting into a, a potential future trail uh, connection as well. So a little bit about our progress to date. The first thing we wanted to do was visit the lake, uh, lake determine uh, access points, uh, what the lake is used for currently. We wanted to look at other city parks to get an idea of programming, uh, see how it all ties together as a system. Um, and then we met with potential user groups that are listed here uh, and stakeholders to get an idea of what their interest may be in a boating facility on the lake. We had a lot of good conversations with all these people to, to determine um, you know, varying interest in different types of uses. So out of those conversations, one of the things that came about was uh, small uh, boat sailing, which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a sunfish sailboat, something uh, up to about a 15 foot vessel um, could be used in this location. Uh, you'd need a launch ramp and some storage could be required. Uh, but the pros are it's a lifetime uh, sport, so it's really something that everybody can do with, with minimal uh, teaching. It's something that uh, every age group could uh, have interest in. It's a highly visual activity on the lake, so if you're sitting at a restaurant or something on the lake, just seeing the kinetic energy going back and forth is, uh, is something to see on, um, on the lake. Uh, the cons is there's really no current program. I think there's been some, some sailboats on the lake previously, but really... Um, Access is kind of limited at, at this point. I know you have two boat ramps there currently, uh, 
the uh, spatial restrictions, it does require, you know, a space for uh, cars to bring in the boats and, and uh, things like that. So extra parking and, and that uh, sort of thing. And then the facility cost for whatever you add is obviously something to consider uh, just determining uh, the size of that. Another activity would be crewing and rowing. Um, this is again uh, a lifetime sport. Uh, it's something that um, requires, uh, uh, the boats are a lot longer, so up to 62 feet long. So it would require a little bit longer uh, docks. Uh, so spatial restrictions could be a, a limiting factor there. But again, they're highly visual. Um, there's opportunities for competitive rowing, uh, recreational rowing. I know Shriner University was interested in anything that brings students in as a recreational value because it's, it's something else they can offer. And so that was something they mentioned. Um, and it would be uh, another highly visual, like I, I said, another highly visual activity on the lake. So uh, the next is paddle boarding, which I think you're all familiar with. Uh, it's actually um, an established use right now on the lake. There is a, a rental vendor, vendor that rents paddle boards and kayaks. Um, again, lifetime sport. Uh, really easy to kind of learn. It's uh, something that uh, young kids can do, the elderly can do. It's it's something fun to get out on the lake, but it is a seasonal activity. So once uh, the winter time hits, I don't think you'd want to be out there right now because <laughs> it's a little bit cold. chilly. Yeah. But um, it's another activity that uh, is currently uh, being used. And then kayak and canoeing, which, uh, like I said, it's another established uh, use on the lake. Again, all age groups can participate. Uh, it's, it's increasing popularity. There's a lot more things happening with kayaks. There's kayak uh, fishing tournaments that go on with uh, KBF and things like that. Uh, it's low cost. The only real downside to uh, the kayak and canoeing is just access and how you get the kayaks into the lake. Uh, it's not really recommended to drag them across um, hard ground because it can kind of damage the vessels. But if you had some sort of good access to the lake, it would be uh, an ideal situation. And then another act activity that kind of came out of these discussions were dragon boat racing. And these types of races kind of started way back in China and, and has evolved into what it is today, which are these large, uh, almost 40 foot long decorated boats. This wouldn't be something that you would do every day, but possibly a, a once a year type of event that could draw people in from other communities to have a dragon boat, ra dragon boat race competition. Uh, again, highly visual. It's something that would really stand out on the lake. Uh, popular for college age users, so that would be something that Schreiner could be interested in as well. Um, you would probably need an event uh, promoter just to get you know people into town, but it could could be that draw. So the only real con there is that the spatial limitations. Uh, you since they're such a large boat, you would need to have some sort of staging area uh, mm -hmm. to get everything going, but. And currently there's no established uh, user groups, which kind of goes back to the promotion portion of that, but it's an opportunity uh, that the lake pro could provide. So one thing we wanted to do was go around the state and look at other facilities and kind of see what they're doing and see if we could apply that to uh, what we've learned here. We started by looking at uh, Baylor University Marina in Waco. It's obviously a lot larger facility. If you can see in the top left corner, uh, that's a little marina. It's kind of evolved over time, but they offer a little bit of everything. They have a storage facility for sailing. They've got, I think, 16 uh, sunfish sailboats. It's, um, it's really a, a seasonal kind of deal where they have um, rowing, canoeing, and kayaking, and it's really open to campus students. Uh, they do have a few programs open to the public, but a little bit different in the way they would operate it. But um, operations budget, the $40,000 uh, range. And if you were to build this facility today, it would be probably north of $4 million. But they've done this over time, kind of um, pieced this together. And it's actually a really neat facility. I won't touch on all of these since we have uh, some, some time limitations. But it, you kind of understand the, uh, the general uh, uh, concept of what's going on. This is the Woodlands Rowing Center, uh, primarily rowing, canoeing, and kayaking. And you can see. The, uh, the docks that come out uh, extend into the lake and uh, operated by the rowing club. They do have um, a boathouse, which is about 9,000 square feet, that houses their boats in the off season. So that's something that you will kind of can see a, 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 a common theme throughout these facilities. 
Same thing in Town Lake, kind of comes out. Uh, there's two different areas there that extend out into the lake. They've got a 7,000 square foot boathouse. Uh, it's, it's roughly the same size, it's about an acre and a half, um, but it's got a launch platform. Um, and the cost of that today would be about three million. The rowing club, I, I like this one just because you can see the, the actual views out to the lake on the terrace they have there. It's, it's actually really beautiful when you go out and, and sit out there at sunset. But you could see something like that being very similar to the situation you have here um, as a uh, focal point. I mean, this the lake has been identified as one of the best resources the, uh, that you guys have to offer. And, and to have that out there would be magnificent. But um, same thing with Dallas United Rowing Center. The thing I'll say here is uh, uh, this facility was built uh, in a floodplain, but it was built to flood. It's got vents on the bottom, so when the water rises up, um, water comes through. And, and so that was the whole deal there. The, the, the difference with where this is located, with what you guys uh, have, and I'll touch on this in a little bit, is this is located in a place when it floods, the water level just rises. There's no real velocity coming through the river. Obviously, when your, your lake floods, we have high velocity. So uh, I don't know that a situation like this would necessarily work well with what you guys in the, have in the floodplain, but it was something we wanted to look at anyways. And then just for, for grins, we looked at uh, a large uh, rowing and sailing facility, Corinthian Sailing uh, in Dallas. And I, as you can see, there's over you know, 270 boats here, but it's got a floating dock, it's got a floating marina. It's really kind of you know, the, the sailor's dream when they go out and, and have a place to go. And uh, so just wanted to look at different scales, different options and things like that. White Rock, uh, the, one, the thing I'll mention with this facility is that they have a, a, uh, a large 25,000 square foot building that part of it is used as a wedding venue to, off, to offset some of the operating costs they have with the <coughs> rowing facility. So we wanted to think about that too. I mean, if you were gonna do something like this, how could you help your operating costs um, if that was an option? So then we started looking at, that's around the state. Let's look at uh, existing facilities that are actually on the Guadalupe River. And obviously Shriner Park Swim and Boat Dock, they've got uh, about an acre with a parking lot and it's used for fishing, swimming, and, and boating. The um, Nap Boat Launch, which is on Nimitz Lake, um, it's, it's got two side docks. Um, mainly people use it to, to launch a boat for fishing or you know canoes and kayaks. So that's it's kind of the, one of the main access points that you have for the, for the lake today. And then the bistro, uh, this was interesting because it's actually got the built-in kind of concrete um, storage locker for boats that you, that, you know they used to uh, rent boats out of. But the, some of the problems they had was, getting boats out, access uh, in and out of that facility due to its, uh, the way it's situated. There is a dock there that you can uh, come up and, and dock your uh, canoe or whatever they rent there. But um, it's, it's actually, it got our wheels kind of turning like, you know, what could this do in another location or how could we make that better? Um, it's a private facility. Currently the top portion is used for a restaurant. So some of the user group findings, obviously, like I mentioned, uh, Nimitz Lake is a very important resource. Uh, I think everybody agrees that the recreational value uh, is, the, is a kind of an unlimited potential. I mean, there's so many things you can do out there. Um, it's highly supported. The thing is, is, um, is, there, is there a feasible space to do what we need to do? And that's kind of what we started to look at after this. But, uh, sailing and rowing would require a permanent storage facility, possibly. Uh, whether that's on the lake or somewhere else, that's you know would be determined uh, to be determined. But um, there is possibilities there. Uh, and then Shriner's current priority right now is the aquatic center. They didn't really have an interest in pursuing collegiate rowing activities at this time. Not to say that it couldn't happen in the future, but they are interested in the recreational value. So. Um, the, and the last thing there is uh, for potential grants. Uh, there are TPNW grants that are that you can apply for up to half a million dollars for boat ramps, including things like breakwaters, parking lots, which is a matching grant. And there are also uh, smaller grants that could be used to uh, provide 
vessels and things of that nature. So there are different funding opportunities out there that uh, you could look at if that's something that interests you. Uh, after we got all that information, we decided to uh, look at the actual feasibility of the site. And that's when we got into talking to public works, the city staff, uh, and uh, talking about what the lake does during flooding events um, kind of made us pause a little bit and say, okay, this big tree right here was carried down the, the river in one of the floods. So anything you put out into the lake, like we saw in some of those examples, would be destroyed if you know a, a rain event came, high velocity water came through there. And so anything you put out would have to be armored. You know, I mean, you'd have to really build it up to where it's not gonna be damaged by the floods. Uh, also droughts, if the water, if, if the city needed to, they could drain down the lake a little bit uh, during a drought uh, for water usage. So that could affect what you do with a boating uh, center. Um, and then the main thing is because this is in a floodplain, any, any kind of structure you build would need to be at least a foot above the floodplain. So that's kind of a limiting factor as well, considering this whole site is in a floodplain. Um, and then the last thing is the permitting could be a, over a two year process due to um, the type of use this would be on this lake. So all those things we had to consider when we were looking at um, creating some concepts. So we came up with three kind of concepts. Uh, the first one was really based on this current concept, which we, we got from the McDonald, uh, McDonald's company's master plan, which basically if you look in the, um, get this, if you look in the kind of the top right there, that's a parking lot, that's the, the site we're talking about um, and with a trail connection. So we kind of wanted to keep with that concept uh, and our first uh, stab at it, which we're calling concept A. Um, again, this is about an acre and a half. We, we kept the, the parking lot. We created a little boat ramp down, kind of an inlet cut to protect it a little bit. Um, but this is a really straightforward, easy way to gain access to the lake. I mean, you've got two other um, access points. This could create another on the other side of the lake um, at a, probably a minimal cost, about a million dollars. Um, and then also have opportunities in the future if there was a trail coming through to connect through the boat ramp area. And here's a cross section. And the, really the most important thing I want to show you on this, you can see the existing grade. This is um, the dash line here is the existing grade. So you would see a, a little bit of a cut to come down to the lake. But this line up here, this is your approximate location of the 100 year floodplain. And so any structure you build would have to be above that, which you can see is, is a, quite a bit of fill there. So we didn't know if that was necessarily feasible for this site uh, to go with a structure um, just because of the, the location of the floodplain. So then we started thinking, all right, let's, let's look at what we saw at, in Waco. That was a pretty neat concept. Uh, how can we apply that to uh, this site? And so we did a little mini marina. And if you cut out from the lake inside, you can see uh, we, we cut it up, we stack it up with lead stone. Um, it's got a, uh, a little walkway, an accessible ramp that comes down here. You could have a, a kayak canoe vendor right here. You can, you can cart the uh, canoes down, and kayaks down to a launch area. And one thing we thought would be really neat uh, here was to have some kind of iconic structure in the middle of that that really says, uh, this is a place to go on the other side of the lake. I mean, you've got the boat ramps on the other side, but you wouldn't really think to come over here unless you saw something like this. And we were thinking um, if you, a lighthouse would be a perfect kind of iconic structure there saying this is the way. Uh, you can see it's still below uh, the 100-year the floodplain, but you'd have to fortify all that. But if this floods, you're kind of protected from the velocities of the flood. You're still going to have some rising water. So uh, the, the actual uh, launch areas, the docks would float up and down, but they wouldn't be destroyed by a, a high velocity event. Uh, also part of this concept was a boat ramp that kind of comes along, uh, is that James Road, and uh, comes into the, into the lake there. The biggest con with this concept though is there's no parking. So because it's such a small site, um, we didn't have room for parking and creating this little marina. So we had to keep thinking, how can we make both those things happen? So we kind of merged those two concepts together and then taking kind of what we learned from a, uh, a project in Austin, creating a uh, kind of a breakwater out into the middle of the lake could still create that 
protected marina, but allow for more space for parking. Uh, still have a, a ramp down uh, James Road for sailboats and things like that, but having a place that uh, a floating dock that that um, could provide a access inside that marina would actually kind of marry those two concepts together. So in the section view, uh, you can kind of see it uh, that way. So again, you're you're allowing uh, all these different types of activities, uh, sailboats, canoes, whatever it is, into the water. Uh, to take advantage of the lake, to take advantage of the views and everything like that. And just real quick, I, there's a video here, but I, I can't show you the video, but the, um, here's some examples of what floating kayak and launch docks could look like if you were uh, to put one of these in. It's a, it's a lot easier to, uh, especially if you're fishing or if you've got a lot of gear, you put it in the kayak and then it's an easy way to step into your kayak, roll back out and then come back in. So this kind of gives you an idea and then uh, if you look closely here, this is the pole that's uh, during a flood event when the water rises, this pier would rise with it and come back down and it would st stay on that pole and you wouldn't end up down that river anywhere. So um, those are the types of elements we're thinking about when we're thinking about incorporating those into a, a little marina. So to sum all that up, um, some additional comments and considerations. Um, You'll notice we didn't put a boathouse or any kind of storage facility. Like I said, that's that would require us lifting it above the floodplain, which uh, really wasn't feasible on this site. But that doesn't mean that a, a uh, boat storage couldn't be provided at an off-site location and, and store during the off-season. Uh, racing events of sailboats and sprint, sprint kayaks um, could be club-organized fun races. Uh, they could be community organized festivals or small invitation or regattas of 10 to 20 boats and we think there's an opportunity for that as well. Uh, the Nimitz Lake Invitational could attract uh, competitors, visitors and media from the region. Um, it'd be visu visually appealing sporting events. Uh, you know, it's something that everybody could come out and watch, especially if there's opportunities in restaurants that, that look down onto the lake. Uh, and the main thing is when you start increasing the use of your lake, you're going to have to start increasing uh, the parking, the access points and things of that nature. So it's something to consider um, because right now I feel like it's pretty minimal what you have. Uh, and so increasing the access there is probably something you should consider moving forward. But I ran through all that pretty quickly. Uh, I know we have a kind of a time limit, but I wanted to get through that stuff so we could talk about any questions you may have. Uh, so we're looking at a total, total area of how much? About a, as far as the land goes? Yeah. About an acre and a half. Acre and a half, okay. Um, the, uh, this, is, this is very interesting. Um, I remember this, when I was in school in England, the, the, the excitement of the team rowing and the competition between the colleges and so forth was, was very exciting. And my daughter's in the uh, Austin uh, Rowing Club and thoroughly enjoys that. Uh, but it, it sounds like we would have a hard time without bo adequate boathouses accommodating the bigger boats. That's, right? I mean, it, it, especially on site, it would be difficult. Um, now there, like I said, there's opportunities for offsite storage, but it is a little bit more challenging to get boats to and from the water, you know, in the, during the season. So ideally you would have a boathouse on the lake like you've seen in the other facilities. For those types of events. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> what is our total water acreage? I think you mentioned it. Yes, ma'am. It's. Uh, I want to lie to you. Yeah. It is approximately ninety-five acres surface area. With some of these other areas, um, I assume they've they've got things in place for controlling the usage. I, I mean, I could see <laughs> this could be you could get a lot of people out there and a lot of things going on. So, do they have some pretty good rules and regs in place? Well, a lot of them aren't. Uh, a lot of them are operated by um, kind of private clubs, and so it's a little bit different. Uh, this would be uh, depending on how it's operated here that would need to be considered as well. Uh, but um, 
you know, like Town Lake, it's obviously a large public lake. There's a lot of different access points. So uh, this is a little bit more unique and that kind of goes into our last uh, comment that accessibility, uh, crowd control going into the lake, if you increase the usage, that's something to consider as well as, as how do you do that? Because there's only, there's limited access points here. So yes, that's something that you would have to consider as well. And that's, that would probably go into the next step of the evolution of what this is, but um, definitely. Uh, I was just curious, do we have a rowing club in Kerrville, like with Shrine, or I mean, we'd have no body, no. well, okay, there's nothing like that. Uh, I mean, I, I see the potential uh, of maybe the restaurant, you know, um, I guess depending on the height and on how you would build it above the floodplain, but you know, other places I've lived like Miami, it was more, it was just as much a draw to go have dinner on the deck as it was to have recreation during the day. I mean, there were people who liked to just go and sit on the deck and watch uh, whatever was happening on the river. So I, I kind of see if that can be worked out um, to, to meet the requirements for the flood prepara preparation and planning and all of that. Um, and then the, I noticed in one of your pictures there's a fire patrol boat in the picture. So, you know, it brought, it kind of triggered the idea of, well, would we as a city need to be um, involved in that safety factor at some point too? So just something for us to think about. Right. Yeah, obviously when, you've, when you increase the usage, you know, it's probably something to consider. I mean, you see it on other parts of the river, you know, especially New Braunfels, obviously lots of people use that and there is a presence of police and fire. Well, it has to be, yeah. yeah. Okay, it was great. I'm, I'm hopeful. <laughs> I mean, we have to start somewhere. We have some good information now, so. So, my, my question, I interrupt you. No, I'm done. My, my question is basically, and not, maybe not as much for you specifically, but next steps. So, we had private funding, and, and we're looking at a, a really great presentation. Thank you for, for doing this for us. Um, so, Sure. Um, so the, obviously this is just concepts and feasibility only because there was a desire of the group, to, and again, this came to us from uh, multiple parties. Um, some of them are in the audience today, Shrine University, John Anderson, uh, CVB. Um, most recently, we have invited UGRA to participate in at least exploring this. Um, so the next steps would be to look at funding potential with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and others. Um, and um, McDonald's have also been involved because, you know, their, their property is adjacent, but they donated this land, this 1.5 acres, as part of their park dedication requirement. And so we, as a city then, with the, all the folks that you, you heard, are now looking at it as a potential for to be kind of a special use park. And um, all the details about operation that you're 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 raising would would need to be addressed. But um, so we really don't have a clear path forward at this point because it's just a concept. We'd have to explore who has an interest uh, in being a part of this. Um, do they want to take it to another level? Um, because this we don't we're not into design yet at all. It's just concepts. Uh, so whether there was a restaurant somehow incorporated, whether you know, we did the ramp or didn't do the ramp, or maybe, you know, we, we, we said, you know what, this isn't quite right for us. We're just going to focus on the two ramps that we have on the other side of the lake and do something there. So I think the next step is to go back to our group and say, okay, we've heard the presentation. We know the feasibility from a um, construction standpoint and the issues with the water, as well as um, what sort of, um, you know, uh, restrictions there are, so to speak, with regard to the you know the width of the river and, and the lake and so forth, and then just at, see if there's um, some interest in moving it uh, forward beyond there. And uh, Mayor, I don't know if there's others that want to speak that were involved uh, or not, but um, yeah. I, I would like to hear from uh, John Anderson if we could. Uh, uh, John's been very involved in this, and uh, if you just share some of your perspective. And by the way, uh, UGRA uh, apparently is interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I'm imagining that if, if any of you sitting up there have not yourself been involved in some of these small types of boats or 
watercraft are talking about it may be a bit to try to sort out. Uh, I will just offer a, a vision for you. I think that it's... John, if, if you would speak up just a little bit. I, I would offer a vision for you. I think that it is uh, quite feasible that five or ten years from now, you could have on any day of the week, and particularly on weekends, look out on that on Nimitz Lake and either see small sailboats racing or sprint kayaks racing or people just recreationally sailing or paddle boarding. Uh, there's, there, I mean, it's feasible. It's not easy. And the, and the, biggest, the biggest challenge is uh, finding a way to get access and egress from the water for the watercraft. That's the, that's the toughest problem, but I, I mean, I'm not an engineer. I've seen other places in the country that, where they've solved these kinds of problems. I personally think it's doable, but I grant that it's not, it's not obvious and simple about how you get it done. I think as you, there was a question about, uh, I think Julie, you asked the question about, or, or suggested, is this lake gonna get crowded? Are we gonna have a problem? And I think that in fact, as a council, you should anticipate looking forward, whether you do this project or not. At some point in the future, you're gonna have more and more people putting craft of some mm -hmm. sort on that water. It's pretty common, uh, you have, I think the city owns, if I understand, owns the dam. It's very, very common for communities to create within their own jurisdiction and their police uh, work, create a, <coughs> essentially a, uh, a water safety patrol and create their own rules for use of the lake. An example would be at places where they water ski a lot. It's very common for, for a town to establish the rule that says if you're gonna water ski, you have to leave at perpendicular to the shore or something like that. And, and there are limits about where you have speed limits and, and so forth. I think you should anticipate that that will happen regardless of whether this project goes forward or not at some point in the future. I think that um, in this presentation, you saw a choice, a menu of a lot of different types of watercraft. And I think that as you sort your way through it, generally speaking, the longer and the, or the heavier a watercraft gets, the more challenging it's going to be to have, find a way to get it in and out of the water and store it. For example, uh, Mary, you talked about the long uh, shells that they use and that your, I guess your daughter uses. Some of those, I don't know what the total length can be, but they can be very long. There also are what they call sprint kayaks, where similarly shaped, they're only 15 feet long. They weigh 20, 25 pounds. So they, it's much easier to get those in and out of the water and to store them. And it is the longer boats. And sprint kayaks, for example, uh, it's been in the, in the group that we have that's been working on this, part of what we've been looking for is watercraft that in addition to just pure recreation and fun, can, can be used in competitive sports and could have opportunities for area grade school and high school students, the university, and, and be the types of craft that have pathways all the way up through national championships and the Olympics and the Pan American Games. And there are several types of craft that we've talked about that would meet that criteria. And they're all small, they're all 15 feet or under, they're, they're 150 pounds or less, and they would offer a multitude of opportunities for competitive activity. In terms of controlling the use, if you had, if you end up and had you built the center and you had incredible demand for it. So you had kayakers and, and canoers and sailors and, and uh, paddle boarders. And you, you start to worry about it being crowded if you want to have races or so forth. Generally what you would have is a club, a boating and sailing or canoeing club. And they would take it upon themselves to essentially establish rules of the road. And they would, they would uh, work out and make compromises so that if you're going to have uh, a, a stand-up paddleboard competition on Saturday morning, 
they would make certain that you didn't have sailboat racing or something else going on at the same time. It's a pretty simple thing to do because you would put all of these uses uh, under one essentially umbrella club. Right. Makes sense. Good. Any questions, uh, Mr. Anderson? Would you like to mention skiing? I would not ski boats. This would never, ever, I would not en envision this ever having ski boats there. No, I, don't think no, it's I understand you. I didn't mean to suggest that. What I was saying is in other places <clears throat> in the country, that's an example of they have a club. communities have oh, okay. established their own rules, okay, yeah. and they'll have a boat with a, a water patrol, it's a member of the police department, that just sort of periodically patrols the lake. And they, they establish rules that govern the use of the water so that, you know, typically where you have conflicts with water skiers or jet skis and things like that, they establish rules about how you can approach the shore and how you go out and at what speeds and things like that. The, the two accesses that we have on the other side of the river, would access there be controlled by the one that we're talking about putting in? That's all to be determined. To be determined. That's an operational okay. I mean, thing. We're not involved in any kind of regulation right now. No, yeah. not really, other than it can't be... Um, Motorized? Yeah, electric boats are okay, or paddle, that kind of thing. And, and now and in the future, motor boats would not be allowed. That's right. That's a drinking water source, and so we wouldn't do that. Okay, all right. I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that makes this Nimitz Lake so attractive for developing this, these types of recreational and sporting activities is that you don't have power boats. Okay. And the fact that you've got a long season gives you an opportunity to create you know, visual sporting events for the city. What about a boat that, for dinner, barges that would oh, provide a dinner? dinner. Boat. But they're electric. It, well, and is there, they'd have to be electric, right? Battery no. operated. No, no combustion no. engines. Nope, okay. But it would be something that maybe. Or solar or whatever. I something. think that if you've got any of these activities <coughs> going to start, and I think in any of them that's going to take a few years, there is no obvious market. I mean, there isn't, right. a, you know, we're not a, a bay on, on the coast of New England. So <laughs> whatever you do here with any of these uh, recreational or sporting activities, we're going to have to develop the market. And I think you would use the, the schools in the community. There, There's, for example, throughout the country, I think there's six or 700 high schools in the country now have sailing teams. <laughs> so you could have sailing, high school sailing teams if you wanted. Uh, once that any of these uses got started, I think you would find people come into those sports that never thought about coming into it. They would observe what's going on in the lake. One of the great advantages you would have to attract visitors, as well as to help residents enjoy the place, is these sports are, are several of these are very visual, and the lake, one of the advantages of being relatively small is you're sitting on the 50-yard line to watch these things. Most of these sports, if you want to watch them, you're at, you know, a mile away and it's hard to see it. So you've got an, a, a, a unique opportunity, I think. I like the, the point you made about um, it's going to get busier. We have a development that's happening right there on the land part. So there's a good possibility more people will want access or decide they want to try a watercraft of some type that never did before. So we will see more, you know, activity. We, so planning for it might be better than just, well, now we have um, residents living there and, and their grandkids come in and they're putting watercraft in here or there or wherever. So to have some type of plan is better than no plan, I guess, is what I'm thinking. Because it really hasn't been that busy, except for when we have the triathlon. I, would also, I know your, your time is short. I would also offer the, the thought, um, if you took the facilities that you have uh, in the park on Flat Rock Lake, if you could put those on wheels and roll them down to the site you're talking about here, you're in business. That's all you need. It's just, it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we're talking about, at minimum, the landowner, which is McDonald's, um, 
and then the city where the dedication of the parkland is. And then, if I'm not mistaken, UGRA has an easement, if not ownership, of a strip of land that gets. Am I correct? In, in, in no, uh, they don't own it. Um, we do. The, all as, the way to the water. Mm -hmm. But the, but they have a role because they're you know the river authority through that area. So. Okay. All right. Thank, well, you, also, thank you very much. Yes. Let me just offer if you if you got several of these uses going and they and you you developed interest in the community and you wanted to have a Nimitz Lake festival or whatever you could have you know a three day festival or something and have several of these different types of watercraft having sporting events and you could you could operate them out of your several parks on the lake you don't have to do everything out of out of one what? location you, know, you can set up tents for a couple of days to you while you ran the festival All right good good thank you thank you and uh, <clears throat> I should say that uh, Mr. Anderson was the national champion in uh, boating competition when he was at West Point so Naval Academy All right. yes. uh, uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> they are playing this weekend, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Austin, thank you. This is uh, yes. very interesting and very helpful, particularly to look at the different sites and the uh, different possibilities. So, like the ideas. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Do you have speakers? Yeah. yeah. Do we have any speakers? Shelly, do you have anybody signed up? No. Okay, all right. At this time, 4.41, uh, the council will recess uh, to upstairs to an executive session.